So you want to be a writer. Maybe you've got a story to tell, but now what? Welcome to the Author Strong Podcast, where we'll take you from the first page to being a published author by providing you with the tools you need to succeed. Now welcome your hosts, Matt Morris and Nancy Elliott. Hey everybody, welcome to the Author Strong Podcast, where we give writers the tools they need to succeed. My name is Matt Morris, and as always, I'm joined by Nancy Elliott. Nancy, how's it going? Awesome, awesome. This evening, Matt, thanks for asking. No We're joined problem. by an amazing guest that I'm very excited we have on the show with us today. We are joined by an amazing guest today. Jim, we're sorry, we're joined by Jim Heskett. I'm just going to start talking to him because we've been talking for like an hour now. Jim, how's it going? <laughs> hey, guys, what's up? How's everybody doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Nancy's Fabulous. Excited. Nancy's super excited. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's fun getting you back on the show, Jim. Like, we recorded a few episodes with you, and so this is also a first for us, right? So we recorded a number of episodes with you, like, I don't know, a year and a half ago. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we still haven't released one. Like, I, like I'm holding what? on to you, like a, like, a, like, a, like a greedy person, right? I don't even remember what we talked about. I think we were talking about the Iran deal on that episode. I, that's probably dated by now. All, all I know is we talked about a lot of dinosaur erotica. Yep, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> and we should... We should probably tell the listeners out there that this episode will be split into 11 parts, which you'll hear starting next week, streamed out until July of 2017. That's the plan. Yeah. I mean, we were going to actually release this one because we, we normally do cut, you know, break everything up. And so this one, we're going to do something special, actually. We were going to release it, like, every other day, just to be <laughs> weird, right? So, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, just right. to be cool. Really no, but, get our mileage out of it. Yeah, I, well, I, you know, that said... The, it's a you know it's an excellent uh, kind of transition because one of the things we are going to do starting with this one that we haven't done with the live shows in the past in the past we have all we've released all the live shows the next day as one episode and with this one we are actually going to start breaking them up just like all the other episodes that we release just for consistency's sake um, and so if if you're you know if you're hanging out with us live you get to see it and whenever you go to the website you can watch the whole broadcast. But as far as the podcast goes, it will come out tomorrow. It'll probably come out all weekend because it's 60 minutes long. So it'll be like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday episode. I um, see. Well, 30 minutes from now, I'll try to say something with a cliffhanger. Yes. That would be funny. I actually thought about doing that. Like, maybe we should try and build it in, like a timer. I'm like, okay, we're ending it now, you know? And then... I say know. something dramatic. Yeah. A big reveal. Exactly. Well, that should work with what we wanted to talk about today, right? So... Yeah. Nancy's on point today. <laughs> Woo! I need the little like Facebook shark stick that says on point because that's you. Oh no, you know them enough to know which one you want to use. You have no idea how well I know them. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, I have a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nancy, that's great. So, what are we talking about today to bring it back around to something serious? Okay, so I'd heard this before, but I'd never really read about it, so it was interesting. I'm glad that this is a topic. We're talking about try fail cycles in your writing. We are talking about try fail cycles, and Jim, this was actually it was an idea of yours. And we talked about it on one of, we brought it up and mentioned it a few times on one of the episodes we recorded with you. I honestly don't remember if that's the one I still have or if it's the one we already released. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So people might get to hear it again, but we talked about it a little bit. It wasn't the topic of conversation, but we did mention tri -fail cycles. Right. I think we were talking about it and using that example of someone going to the store to get milk. That kind of sounds familiar. Yeah, probably. And so, uh, and because we talked about, I think the episode that we haven't released is, um, it might be the common mistakes one. We talked about common mistakes of uh, of authors. Or sorry, mm -hmm. no, actually, it's self editing. How to approach self editing. Right. That's the one we haven't yeah, released. Okay. Now. What? So, that's that's fantastic. We need to put that one out there. Well, it's Push actually it really, the ledge, it's a it really fly. valuable. It's a really valuable episode to me because it is a, literally only one episode. It's not one that's getting broken up into two, and to slot those in like that it has a lot of value because almost everything we do now is either two or three episodes so to have one that's just by itself I have to find the right spot for it to fit it'll come up it'll, it'll probably come out in the next two weeks or so it's special yeah. I know special so we'll get to learn about self-editing with Jim Heskett you're it'll so like special you're, you're like the straight bar in Tetris gotta, gotta <laughs> hang on and keep a special place for that those one are, those are the money bars that's where you get all they your are. Right there. <laughs> Yeah, unless you're playing a certain friend that we both know, and she just ruins you in Tetris. Then it's well, you can play it. another friend named Matt, and he's awful, so oh. he's a lot of points against him. Okay, good. Good to know. <laughs> Excellent. So, Jim, uh, why don't you, you know, that was, it was your idea to talk, uh, to talk about some, uh, to talk about tri-fail cycles. Why don't you give us a brief kind of intro and your thoughts, and then we're going to, we'll launch a discussion about it. 
So a try-fail cycle, <clears throat> it's a way of constructing a story, basically. It's a way of building plot, a way of building conflict and structuring a story, and it's something that can work for both plotters and pantsers, I think. And I'm sure we'll get into that, how, how it can work for both. But it's basically a methodology, and I, I printed out this little thing. I don't know if you can see this here. Wow. Oh, no. Can you see that? Yeah. Oh, the props. People I'll, listening. I'll, I'll focus it in on you so it's not, it's not moving around. People listening on the feed, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll explain it. Yeah, I was about to say, and, and if you are listening on the feed, if you're not watching live, go to our website, go to the show notes for this episode, and the live feed will be there so you can actually see the video of it. Sweet. So the try-fail cycles use, um, I'll describe it in terms of scene sequel. So the basic idea is a character has a goal, the character struggles toward that goal, and then there's a result. That's a scene. And there's a difference between when you think of a scene in a, in a, in a book or a movie as, a, as something that happens at a place in time. This isn't the same kind of scene. And even calling it calling one a scene is a little bit confusing. But it's basically your character has a goal, character struggles toward that goal, and then in the, in the scene there is failure. So it goes goal, conflict, disaster. And then in the second part of that equation, there's the sequel, which is the reaction, the dilemma, and the decision. So the character has a goal, they struggle toward it, and then they fail, or they succeed at a cost. And then in the sequel part, they go, oh, no, I failed. What am I going to do next? And then that leads in the, into a decision to take some kind of action, which then leads into the next goal. Ta-da. Excellent. And, and one of the things, and I probably mentioned this before because I always mention it when talking about try-fail cycles, um, it's something that is scalable. It can be very big. It can span your, your try-fail cycles, can span multiple books, or they can span a single conversation. And that's one of the beauties of try-fail and why it can make, a, make your, your, your book so much more interesting when you are using it because there's natural tension and that tension is what will draw the reader forward and make things interesting. But there's natural tension in the try fail. And so try something, you fail at it. That can be just a simple conversation, or it could be, you know, blowing up the Death Star and then the, you know, the Empire comes back with a new one, right? That's actually probably not a very good example. But <laughs> <laughs> you're going to ambush the Death Star and then you find out that it's fully operational. That sucks. So there. But then um, what? Right, if that's always the question. Yeah, exactly. So, and and uh, and so, I wanted to mention that they're they're scalable. Don't think of it as being like this has to be, you know, three try fail cycles in my book. There could be a million, right? And they there some will be larger than others. And mm -hmm. and so, like when I write, I I write very much this way. And you know, I always bring up the Dresden Files, right, by Jim Butcher. He writes very much that way as well. He also does a lot of scene sequel type work. Um, where he uses, you know, a scene is like something's happening and a sequel is a response to that scene, right? That's what scene sequel is. And, and so he does a lot of that and uh, a lot of try, it fails, okay, sequel, kind of reassess what we're going to do now. Another scene, trying something else, whatever. Um, and so he does a lot of that and that, I think that was where I first really picked up on it, um, along with writing excuses. We mentioned this earlier, so when we talk, when we like to talk craft, we I always try and have like a writing excuses episode to, to reference because they really know what they're talking about. Like we kind of know what we're talking about, and they really know what they're talking about. <laughs> it, it, and uh, I don't think they've they talk about it all the time. So if you just listen to the podcast; mm -hmm. it comes up like every week. But yeah. I don't. I couldn't find an actual episode just on tri fail cycles. Um, so that's unfortunate. But listen to that podcast; they talk about it all the time, so you'll get a, a better feel also for what it is. Um, Cool. Perfect. So, um, Jim, I think we want, uh, I don't know if there was anything else we wanted to do beforehand, but I, I kind of wanted to kick it off. We wanted to, uh, we wanted to kind of start setting up like a little, a little kind of plot so we could use it kind of as examples of, of what a tri fail cycle really looks like. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I had kind of a story prompt. And um, so I guess here we could talk about how this, uh, this would work for plotters or with pantsers for for plotters, um, you would, whenever you're structuring out your story, you would put it in try-fail cycles. The character has the overall goal for the entire story, 
and then the character is going to have smaller goals in service of that story. So you use it when you're creating your outline, which is like basically what we're going to do now. Mm -hmm. If you're a pantser, you can still use this because your you're going to know your character's main overall goal, even if you're a pantser when you're writing your story. And then you're going to come up with a small goal. You're going to pants your way through that. You plot. You figure out a disaster, and then that leads directly into the next goal. So it works for plotters or pantsers, I think. Anyway, so here's the story prompt that I came up with. So we have a lumberjack. Let's call him Lewis. So Lewis the lumberjack, uh, he's got a wife and a young daughter. He loses his job working for the logging company. And so his wife and his daughter are going to leave him because they're going to go move back in with her mother because they don't. he can't afford to take care of them. So Lewis the Lumberjack, he's got to win back his family. That's his goal. His goal is to win back his family. And what he wants to do to win back his family is he finds out that there is a lumberjack competition going on in his town. Let's say he lives in uh, Washington State because there's a lot of trees there, so there's probably uh, lots of lumberjack competitions in Washington. So his goal is going to be to save his family by winning this lumberjack competition. And that's the premise of our story. I feel like okay. this story needs at least two montages. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm Chopping really, wood, yeah, I can see yeah, it right now. There needs to be a training montage, right? And, uh, and then something else as well. Like 80s the, the, era songs only. It needs a transition from Act 2 to Act 3, uh, sorry, Act 1 to Act 2 montage where he realizes he needs to get his family back when they're like leaving him and he's thinking about all the good times with his daughter when she would run up to him after he got back from chopping down trees and now she's leaving and she's sad and he has no trees to chop down and and so yeah that's the that's the okay. first montage the second okay. montage is the training one obviously yeah the rocky montage yeah exactly exactly <laughs> he runs at the end he runs up a step like built of logs <laughs> and then dances that he time. chopped that he chopped right <laughs> right Okay. So if, if you were to think about it, like, so he's got to win this competition. So the first thing we could do is start brainstorming what are some of the things he would need to do along the way. You know, if we have a list of things that he needs to do, then we can structure them in sort of like from least conflict to mm -hmm. most conflict. You know, like maybe I, I started making a list. Um, he's going to want to ask his family to be patient with him. He might need to get the money to enter the competition. He's mm -hmm. going to need to train. He's going to maybe want to check out his biggest competition, um, right. his, his rival. Right. He might need to want to try to get a loan from the bank in order to, you know, to stay afloat until the competition. And then like, we can look at these things and figure out what's, what's going to give us the biggest payoff, and those are the things that we'd put later on in the story. Okay. You could have it like the Days of Thunder where it's like a sponsorship, right? And so he, he comes up and replaces some guy, and so now he's got the he's got the, the villain who, you know, the other lumberjack who... The is, brawny sponsorship. Yeah, That's who's what it would competing be. against him. And so, and so we are kind of, we're doing this off the cuff. We haven't talked about this before, so anyone listening, so we are, mm -hmm. you know, and I like to ramble, but, and so a lot of this isn't going to be like final draft or anything, but this is going to be like the process of what you can do to take um, plot ideas, right? And then mm -hmm. develop them into something more like a cohesive story, with, with you know tension and hopefully interesting things. Right. So perfect. Yeah. Let's talk about it. So he okay. needs maybe you know he needs some of the challenges he might face. Right. He's gonna need some money to enter. He's gonna need um, you know maybe there's limited spots. Maybe there's a there's a tryout portion. Right. So he's got to qualify for it. And then mm -hmm. he's got to come up with the money to pay. For <laughs> this it, is a right? super serial lumberjack competition. If they're like. Spots that you have to claim. Well, I don't want. I mean, if we're gonna do a lumberjack, like this has got to be the lumberjack competition and all lumberjack. It's got to be like lumberjack right? of America. Yeah, it's got to be nationals. Nationals. The, yeah. yeah. I was gonna say universe, but yeah. Oh my God, no! They would never win against the Norwegians. No, no, you have to keep it local. It's got to be America. That America. would. If we could give it like a cool running feel, also, like that would oh, that would be neat. Yes. Okay. Cool running. Okay, so this is the state. The sequel is going to be right. Okay. Lumberjack yeah. Man Two. That'll be you know takes on takes on Norway. It'll be a whole okay. series. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh! Yes, I can. Lumberjack see. Man chops down all the trees. With an option for a movie. Excellent. So maybe what about this is the first thing he needs to do? So the first thing he would need to do, 
let's say he's got a couple of problems right off the bat. He's got to get the money to enter the competition, and he's he's uh, he's pawned his trusty axe. He's pawned his special axe that's that's been his friend because he was so poor. So, the first thing he's going to do is to try to go ask his brother to borrow money. But his so that's his goal. That's his small goal for the scene is he wants to borrow money from his brother. The conflict is that his brother's been mad at him over something that happened in high school for 15 years, so his brother doesn't want to give him the money. Okay. So, okay. His, his goal is, is go, you know, we, we kick it off where he's, uh, he's down to his last straw, kind of inciting incident. He pawns off his, his lumberjack. He needs to borrow money. Um, goes to his brother. And, and so, you know, it, it, especially early on in the story, and this is going to be the case more often than not, like, when you're, when you're looking at these try-fail cycles, they're almost always fail until... Well, in some way, end. right? Yeah. I mean, you don't want to... If you, you know, success leads to happiness, and happiness generally leads to a boring book until, until the end. Right? <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> so... Right, um, okay, so, so he goes to his brother to ask for money, but, like Jim said, his brother's mad at him for, I don't know, stealing yeah. the and this is and this is uh and and this is way too easy of a um like this is a you know if you can just call up your brother right and go find it. it's not like he had to like track down his long lost brother who but what if he did I mean well, and so that would that would change that's a good but that's a good point because you're changing the overall scope of it so it becomes more a much larger thing and so that right. might have a bigger payoff and so that 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 payoff may come at the end I guess mm -hmm. the way I envision it is like it's simple you know yeah you well we want to keep it focused on the competition. Not yeah. like, oh, let me go find my brother who's been lost forever and lives with the bears. Or well, yeah. I mean, if his brother can cut him a check, then he doesn't have to do the competition, right? Okay. Right. So right. he goes to ask him for money. Yeah. But it fails. His brother's like, no, get out of here. Can't do it. So right. it, it could, um, or there's another way to look at it. So there's there's two okay. ways to do a fail. There is, there's, so there's two, in the scene sequel, there's two ways to do a disaster which okay. is the end of the scene part that precedes the sequel. There is the, um, the yes but and the no and. Yep. And the no and is, did he reach his goal? No, and something else bad happened. Like he could go, um, the no and for that might be, he goes to ask his brother for money, his brother says, hell no, get out of here, I'm calling the cops on you, and then the cops show up. That's a no and. Because things oh, get worse, things get worse for him. The right. yes, but is his brother says yes, I will give you the money to enter this competition, mm -hmm. but it comes at a cost. Like he has to do something for his brother that he doesn't want to. That's gonna take up his training time. Like maybe he's got to go deliver something, and it's gonna take two weeks of his yeah. training time. So he's gonna be yeah. set back already. I like I like um because I'm picturing this at the beginning so I, I like the no and I like the mm -hmm. he goes and his brother sympathetic or whatever you know I just don't have them I can't do it and while he's there getting rejected by his his beloved brother um gets the call from his wife saying by the way yeah. we're we're getting evicted you know like yeah, the bank just, like the bank just locked us out of the house and uh and so now we got we're gonna take off and go live with our parents you figure this out right or or that's when he gets the call that oh and I'm leaving you right the wife poor Lewis. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Lewis is not having a good day. Well, we have to make things really, really bad for Lewis because, you know, to have a great character, if if Lewis is sympathetic, you know, if we've set him up in the first couple chapters of mm -hmm. our book as a likable guy, you know, maybe he's really funny, maybe he's, you know, we've included a lot of humor so the reader will relate to him. The more bad stuff we have happen to Lewis the more worried the reader is going to be, and so the more the reader is going to want to see Lewis succeed. We always got to keep the reader worried that the main character is going to fail, you know, worried that the main character is not going to succeed in the end. Right, good point. Exactly, okay. exactly. Okay, so he's just hung up his cell phone. Decision yep. time. And, and so, you know, he, uh, he gets the no from, from the brother, and he finds out the situation gets worse, right? So... Right. Now he's maybe homeless, and and the wife and kid have to take off to you know, they're gonna go be with her parents for a little bit to give them some space or something. Okay, so, so if we if we look at the disaster, if the disaster is that he's getting evicted from his home, 
it would seem. So if we look at the SQL format, the reaction dilemma decision, his reaction is going to be, oh, crap, I'm getting kicked out of my house. The dilemma is, well, I need to save my house, maybe. And then mm -hmm. the decision is, the decision leading directly from losing his house is, I need to go talk to the banker. And maybe I can go to the bank and appeal to them and still save my house. So that would lead directly into his next goal of going to talk to someone at the bank, Mr. Mr. Stuffykins at the bank. Mr. And Burry. maybe he's like family friends with Mr. Stuffykins, so he's hoping that something good will come of that. Either he can wheedle him into like putting a stay. I don't know how any of that stuff works, but right. no, we don't need <laughs> it. Giving him the house or like letting him keep it for a certain amount of time or giving him a loan. Exactly. Okay. I, and I like the idea of uh, yeah. So we, and we don't need to get too too much in the particulars. I like the idea. So he goes to the bank, mm -hmm. talks to the banker, friend or not. Um, can you know what can you do to help me out? Well, I can help you out, but right. So yes, but um, here's the price tag. Like I need I need a payment of this much just to get you caught up, like on on the past due portion or whatever. Right. And then and then we can, we can cut you some time on the rest of it, right? And so now he gets the you know he's got the dollar amount which happens to line up, right, in that cheesy kind of made-for-TV movie sort of way, happens to line up with the, with the, the you know, cash payout of the, of the Lumberjack competition. Hmm. So if we can just take a time out here, in the comments, yeah. Matt said that we should cast Matt Damon as a Lumberjack, and I have to say that I, I definitely do not agree. With no, I, 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 yes, Damon. I'm with Jim. That is Lumberjack. not Lumberjack material. Did lumber, well, maybe if, I think Matt even Damon if you... Everything. Even if you stuck a big fat beard on Matt Damon, I could still only picture him talking about how do you like them apples. No, I mean, at at the <laughs> least it would be an axe. It's at so the least true. it could be Ben Affleck. But I was thinking more uh, maybe a Hemsworth brother. Oh, I could God, see them yes. in flannel. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, yes. It's fine. Yeah, we can cast the word. Be yeah. No. Or just one of the Hemsworths. It doesn't have to be Chris. Either one's fine. I didn't know their names, so I just. With no. Anyway, well, sorry. sorry for you. I know I know Matt Damon because I'll see pretty much. Okay, this is good. Does. I can like really picture like, oh my gosh, Matt, he could have a man bun. He's like a hipster lumberjack. Oh my god. <laughs> Tattoos. We've talked about man buns a lot recently. Right. So. I know. I, it's just a fun word to say. Okay, so now that I've got a good visual on this guy. All right, so we got Chris Chris so, Hemsworth. Sure. Sure. We've got we've got Thor in an alternate universe. Matt Having Damon is Matt Damon's see. the brother then. How about that? I can see that. Yeah, I can see that too. He's bitter because he's not as pretty. Right. <laughs> I'm not gonna give you a loan. You took the lead in this. <laughs> exactly. Okay, All so right. he's at the bank. Got it. Chris goes to the bank. Time in. Uh banker says, Yes, I can help you out, but you know, I'm gonna help you out by making you pay your bill. Essentially, right? Right. Uh, Jim, unless you had something else okay, so. that you, you thought about for that. So maybe, I like that, the yes but there is that maybe because he has to pay Mr. Stuffykins to save the house, now he doesn't have enough money to get his prized axe out of Hawk. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. So then he decides his next decision is to break into the pawn shop. I like the idea ultimately yes. of you know the one of the, one of the like act two to act three realizations is that like the man makes the axe and the axe doesn't make the man, right? When he realizes <laughs> he doesn't actually need the prized one, like he can do it without. He's just he picks up the twenty five dollar one at Home Depot and he realizes that the power was inside of him the whole time. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Right. Exactly. Or we could do the thing where he gets it back, but then it breaks or something right before the big competition, and he has to use like a competitor's axe or something. Either way. Yeah, yeah. We could turn this into a hero's journey with some other. It's already it's already kind of going that, that well, way. We need, anyway. like, we need like the trainer lumberjack, right? The the old has been. We're we're not there yet. We're not at the training part yet. Well, we, we're not at the montage. We got we got to meet him soon. If, we do. Okay, so so now he's so he's gonna break into the pawn shop now. Is that it? Well, that was that would be a pretty serious. That's a that's a different turn story. to take. Yeah, that's a different story to take. Aww. Okay. And so, because this guy's He's, pretty straight up. Our so lumberjack is too lawful good for my taste, but we're we're gonna <laughs> I'm gonna keep going. Like that's fine. <laughs> okay, so he can't get yeah. it out of the pawn shop. Um, well, is that still think, a priority? So if you point? think about it, 
Uh, breaking into the pawn shop could be the kind of thing he might do, but that might be later on in the story because that would more be the kind of thing, yeah at a more yeah. desperate point. And this early in the story, if we're maybe I don't know, like seventy-five pages into the book by now, mm -hmm. I don't think he's desperate enough to take that kind of measure. Good and point. also, if if he's if he's a good guy and he breaks into the pawn shop, he's going to lose a lot of reader sympathy. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. If, if we've if the reader has spent two hundred and fifty pages with him and really gets where he's coming from, then the reader might buy him breaking into the pawn shop. The the breaking in is when he's like hanging from the cliff by the last finger. Like this is the only <laughs> option, and then it doesn't work either. Like the breaking in doesn't work either, and so now you just feel bad for him. Or it's not there. That would be good. That would be horrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's been it's already been sold yeah. to his brother, right? The evil Matt. Damon. Oh yes, yeah. We're gonna put a pin in that and come back to it. Exactly. Okay. It's it's Matt Damon from that one Christopher Nolan movie that just came out. I forgot. That. <laughs> Interstellar. Yeah, thank you. It's so, Matt Damon. So he okay. uh, he doesn't have the money to get his prized axe out of Hawk. So what right. he decides to do is his his reaction is he's in shock. He he's doubting himself. He doesn't think he can win without it. And the dilemma is he knows he still has to push forward because he's losing training time already. Everyone else has got a head start on their training. And his decision is he's going to go buy that $25 axe at Home Depot because he has to have something. Right. And he's going to go buy the axe, and he's going to start training. Okay. So that would lead into the next goal, which would be... I would say if we want to, uh, if we want to, if we do want to take the hero's journey thing, I would say like he doesn't even have the money to go buy that, but he finds another kind of uh, small-time business guy where he's like, "Look, I'll work for you. I just, you know, I need to, I need to be able to use your your stuff in off hours when I'm not kind of laboring away, right? So I can train and whatnot." So the guy says, it. "I will give you an axe if you let me spray paint my company's name on your flannel during the competition." <laughs> Yes. Some so point. ratchet, but okay. I'll I was go with yeah. That. I was picturing more of the Rocky thing where you get the you know, I forget the character's name is awful. I'm not a man anymore, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing movie. If you haven't seen Rocky, it's an amazing. Movie. Like one okay. of the <laughs> right, right. No, the I know. What you, okay. Yeah. Training. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> okay, so he has the axe. He so he says yes. Because he needs it, right? He needs the axe, so he agrees. He needs to something. Do that. He's desperate. He's desperate, right? right? And so even even affording the twenty-five dollar thing at the at the store like that, that could be a stretch, right? Yeah. Well, he doesn't need to be spending any money, right? <laughs> right now, right? And like so, he's eating cans of beans. <laughs> There's, you know, backs against the wall. Yeah. So. Yeah. So he he finds he finds someone where he's like he can do some work for him, and in right. in exchange for the work, he's not getting paid because that guy didn't have any money either, right? It's hard times in the lumberjack community. Um, but in exchange, he gets the use of this guy's stuff. Sure, yeah, he'll he'll be a willing shill at the regionals sure. because there have to be qualifying rounds, right? I mean, we can't just. I mean, if this is nationals, think about it. There's probably going to be a regional, and nationals is far off. That's like the main goal. That's like the climax of the story, whether or not he makes it. Right. Right. It, it, and to to address like so, you know, uh, Brian was. Just asking in the comments, like, how hard is it to get an axe in this town? <laughs> some of this stuff, like, is, it's all off the cuff, so some of it's not going to make sense to make, like, a really good story. But, uh... <laughs> okay, I like this comment. He, yeah. he finds a wizard that turns his hands into axes, and he wins, but he can never have his children ever again. Oh, oh that's so sad. That's the yes, but. <laughs> Does yes, he win? But. Yes, but. <laughs> So, but if okay. actually going back to the story, so if okay. he, if the guy says, "All right, I'll buy you an axe. I'll buy you yeah. a nice axe," uh, but you have to work for me part time for free, so that's a yes, but mm -hmm. because he got what he wanted, he got the axe, mm -hmm. but now he's only going to have four hours a day to train instead of eight because he is um, taking care of kittens at the at the shelter for this guy during you know part time during the day. So he's taking care of kittens in the morning, and then he's training in the afternoon. And so his new goal is that he's got to make up for lost time. He's got to train really hard after he's playing with kittens every morning. So noon to four, he's got to go train. Right. Okay. And so a great so the conflict there is that he's pushing himself. This is like a, a, a little mini man versus nature conflict because he's 
he knows that he's only got you know three or six weeks or whatever left, and he's going to make it for the last time. So he's pushing himself. He's doing lumberjacking things. He's you know rolling on a log in the in the river, mm -hmm. and then maybe the disaster here is he pushes himself so hard he sprains his ankle. Ooh. nice. Yeah, an injury. That's an injury. Yeah, that would make it. Um, so that makes things harder, right? So he's got the training time, and then the yes training, everything's going, but injury, right? But injury. So then the reaction, right? The reaction dilemma. That's how it goes, right? So, so what's his reaction to that? Does he keep trying to train, or? Well, do you think that's a yes, but because I think it's, I would think it's a no and because he's not mm -hmm. catching up. Okay. He's not getting trained quickly enough. Right. And he sprained his ankle, so he's going to okay. have even less time because now he's got to spend a week in the, the back of the shelter with the uh, kitten vet getting treated for his ankle injury. Because <laughs> he can't afford a people doctor. He, he can't afford a people doctor, so he's okay. back there with the kittens Okay. And, and the shelter vet. So things get worse, right? Um, okay. He, he you know gets it taped up, has to probably muscle through some pain and make it happen anyways, right? Right. Okay. And maybe maybe it's time for him to to have a try fail cycle where he actually succeeds at something, you know? Because we've had you can't have in your try fail cycles you can't have every single time characters have to win every now and again. Yeah, I was especially say, in longer books. I was about to yeah. say because we're turning like if if this were to work out in an actual book, this would be a, probably a very long book. So we haven't even talked on like subtopics or anything like that, you know, uh, subplots. Mm -hmm. um, like, what's going on with the family? Um, right. I was going to say, you know, we could have the injury pop up in, like, if we did have a qualifying round, right? That's where the injury could pop up as well. Right. Um, instead of just being at the training, he, you know, he is succeeding at the training. He, he barely muscles out the qualifying spot, right? But he injures himself in the process. Right, and this is exactly the kind of thing that uh, this kind of brainstorming, like I was talking before yeah. about how we have all these goals and then we figure out where they go in the line, so the ankle injury might be, yeah, like Matt said, the last thing that happens before he finally right. figures it out and gets that, that um, you know, where Will Smith shows up and says, you know, the power was in you the whole time. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so that could be, uh, that could be, we could have a lot of things out of that, and that's one of the beauties of the try-fail cycle, especially when you're brainstorming and you're planning. Big fan, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of planning. Um, mm -hmm. However loosely or detailed, like this is probably a little bit more detail that I would even go to. Maybe not. It's about on par. Uh, I wouldn't go too much more detail whenever I write my own stuff than what we're doing here. But I like this because one of the beauties of the try-fail cycle, the yes, but, the no, and, the responses and everything like that, is you don't need to know everything, right? Yeah. So we know, okay, maybe we've got this qualifying round and he's going to succeed. It's going to be a yes, but. Well, that but could be a lot of things, right? It could be an ankle injury. It could be the axe breaks that he was using, and now he doesn't have that anymore. It could be, um, you know, the, the bank comes to him and says, actually, we're going to foreclose. Like, you know, now you've got more problems. Like, it could be a lot of things when you know that kind of formula. And so um, that's what being flexible whenever you plan stuff out like that really helps mm -hmm. you to say, uh, ankle injury is kind of, maybe that's kind of cheesy, right? Or the axe breaking. Like, well, we already dealt with him getting a new axe, didn't we? Right. And so... Maybe that that's kind of cheesy. Have something else happen, and so yeah, it allows you a lot of options to kind of like slot in. Well, I don't know what should happen next. We'll just it does see what happens it, with each with each like version of it. And I and I would say yeah, and and we want to keep in mind stakes, right? Intention, and so mm -hmm. depending on that qualifying round, where that falls in the story. I mean, if that falls towards you know if that falls in the third act, right, the the last quarter of the book or so, mm -hmm. then the stakes got to be. I mean, they got to be way up there, right? And but if it happens towards the beginning. Okay, well, him like injuring, like spraining his ankle real bad. That might be that's reasonable, right? That's something that he can overcome with. Like, yeah, like a, a temporary like. setback. It's not like a game changer. Right. Yeah. So maybe after he injures his ankle, the um, the the kitten vet says, you know, you're you're done. This is a twelve week injury, and he's real down for a day. And then he his his cousin Steve, the doctor, visits and says, no, you'll be back on your feet in three or four days. So there's a bit of hope, and then maybe also at that same time in this family subplot that we haven't talked about, his wife calls him and says, we've decided to stick around for another couple weeks before we abandon you. So he's yeah. got... He's been so looking he's, forward to them come visiting, and now all of a sudden he gets the news. Your yeah, so, 
Right, now he's got some hope. Yeah. But, and then the wife right. says, actually, that's not going to work out for us. Um, and so, <laughs> real quick before we get too far off, because uh, Shannon just asked, uh, Shannon Morgan mm-hmm. in the comments, and we just had an interview with Shannon also. You're going to, mm-hmm. everyone from the podcast is going to get to hear from her next week, which is wonderful. Hey. Um, and she said, do trifail cycle, uh, do trifails happen as often on either side of the midpoint? Do they intensify after the midpoint? My thoughts on that is, and we're talking pretty big trifail cycles here. We're talking kind of big plot point cycles. Um, generally speaking, the trifail, and this is one of the first things that started off, started off with, is they can, I mean, they're going to happen within a conversation, right? Mm-hmm. If, you, if you really pay attention to a lot of good writing, you're going to have this ebb and flow of like, positive, and then nope, that didn't work out the way I thought, and then okay, let's try again, and then nope, that didn't work out the way I thought. Um, they appear everywhere in writing. Yeah, there's so many different scales, right? Yeah. Like it could, yeah. like you said, like it could be a whole story-wide tri-fail cycle, or it could just yeah. be in a conversation. Yeah. That yep. Yeah, it could, I mean, if you have a really long series, like a, a tri-fail cycle could span an entire book, right? Mm, right. Um, and so uh, yeah, you're going to have them pop up all over the place, so it really depends on the scope of the tri-fail cycle specifically. Um, but mm-hmm. you will definitely have tri-fails popping up after the midpoint. Um, it just depends, again, on the scope. But I would say, um, do they intensify after the midpoint was one of her questions, that yes, the later... Yeah, the stakes. The, the stakes go up as the book goes on, right? And so if you have a tri-fail cycle that fails, especially a bigger plot point item that fails towards the end of the book, it needs to be um, you know, a potential game changer for, for the hero. Mm-hmm to give him that opportunity to turn things around and grow and, and become a new character, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I, I wanted to address that. So, sorry, I threw okay. us off. Um, no, we're good. I forgot where we were, to be honest. He just got... He, he, there was a moment of hope in the middle of all this failure because his um, he found out he's not going to be... He's only going to be uh, uh, out of training for a couple days... Mm-hmm. And his his wife, who he thought was leaving him tomorrow, is actually going to be sticking around for a couple more weeks. So he's got a little bit of hope. This is maybe like the midpoint of the book where things are about to get a lot darker. Oh, right, right, before right. they get better. Exactly. We, we had to give him a little bit of hope because we can't have Lewis the Lumberjack lose yeah. all the time or else it would just be too, too much. It would be too much like a Game of Thrones book where... Right. Right. Everything is bad for right. everyone all and, the time. And that is the key thing. We kind of mentioned we we've mentioned it through the plot points a couple times, but to to put kind of a tag on it as well, to call attention to it, the try fail cycles, they can happen um, the yes but no and when you think of it like that, especially, they can happen crossed over between plot and subplots, right? So he's got these other kind of stories. He's got the subplot going on with his family, like how's that gonna work out? The main plot being um, you know, getting into the competition to pay for things to make everything right with the family, but then he's got this tension going on, kind of marital problems or whatever, going on with the wife. And uh, and so you can have successes in one arena and failures in other others. Whenever you kind of line them up correctly, you still get that same... I, I view this all, tri-fail cycles, I view it all as a way of building tension, right? And so the tension is at the, the forefront of what you're trying to trying to get at and telling, you know, a satisfying story where he's overcoming. And uh, and so just keep that in mind that you can interweave them a little bit. And then, as Alita would also point out, to make sure because this ties in a little bit, you know, subplots are subplots; they're not side stories, right? Right. So it needs to tie into your main plot. Your your subplot ties into your main plot; it has something to do with it. Um, yeah. And so, uh, it's not just a random other kind of side adventure that that is <laughs> happening. It's speaking to that point, so back in one of our first trifill cycles where he went to go see um, Lewis went to go see you know Matt Damon his his bearded brother, and his brother called the cops on him. So that that w- could be just as like um, like Matt was talking about a, a way to avoid that being a side story is if that comes back into play, maybe right as things are going good for Lewis, then he gets a visit from the cops. Right. And that's a way to tie that subplot back in, also make things worse for Lewis. Yes. And that, and that is one thing that we're going to miss out a little bit on this, is like you're, you're going to be able to, after you get kind of a, an outline done, right, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to be able to then go back through that outline start to finish and really tighten it when you actually 
have the later plot points really figured out, then you can go back and you can seed them appropriately in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And now would be a perfect example of something where you'd want to do that, where you'd want to kind of wrap it around. Um, also, Brian asked another question, which I think is, is pretty good. We can talk about it. I want to make sure we have enough time, too. Um, mm-hmm. Serious question. What are tips to help avoid making trifail cycles repetitive slash boring? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, mm-hmm. You don't want them to be repetitive or boring. And so... Um, and so I think that uh, what we're doing, especially, you might give some repetitive or boring, like some of the things we're kind of just going off the cuff with, with a little bit more planning, you're, you'd iron those out, right? Um, I would say to make them not boring, make sure that the stakes are going up yep. as the book progresses. We kind of mentioned that already. But if, if the stakes are going up and it makes sense and, and you know, and, and the, and the, the and failure... Obviously, the scenarios successes. would be different. Don't right. have it... Yeah, don't have, like, five different tri-fail cycles with the axe, unless it's, like, someone said earlier in the comments, the one axe to rule them all. And then I guess that's okay, but... Yeah, it's sort of like what we were talking about at the beginning when I was saying we could have a list of things, a list of goals for Lewis, and that he... Um, we would structure them so that uh, the, like, the stakes are increasing because, you know, his goals are getting bigger... Mm-hmm. His conflict is getting more intense, and the disasters are getting bigger each time. Like he's he's trying harder, and he's failing harder successively, like a ladder as it goes up. And that's mm-hmm. how you that's how you keep them from being repetitive and boring. That he's trying bigger things, he's got bigger goals, and he's failing harder. So it looks like the harder he tries to reach the end, the harder he fails. Yeah, and keep right. in mind. In, and then you can interweave also the subplot, right? So his the subplot might be to 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 unite the family, which is also kind of the main plot. Um, mm-hmm. And and so just keep those, and you can kind of interweave them together, and you can you can set out kind of arcs for both, and you can have successes and failures in both that are progressing the story and moving it forward. Um, and you know just keep the stakes going up on both until it's time to wrap you know wrap one or the other or both of them up. And uh, I think that's going to stop it from getting boring. But I like also, you know, to keep it from getting repetitive, you have to plan, uh, plan it out a little bit more in the beginning and then review, you, you know, revisit it after you've finished kind of plan it. Go back, do another second pass at it, and try and punch it up and make it more interesting. Um, and here's a, here's a brilliant plug for Scrivener, that if you, if you pants all this in Scrivener, then you go back and you should say, oh, this, this tri-fail cycle that's here at... at a third of the way through the book should be two thirds of the way through. And you can just drag it down and then go back oh, yeah. and make a few edits. Yeah, Scrivener is wonderful. Um, if anyone who's listening is using Word, quit it right now. Go spend forty bucks on Scrivener. Just do it. Yes, <laughs> just do it. You'll thank yourself. They give so many discounts. Like you, uh, it it's almost hard to pay them full retail price because they give so many discounts so frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. The other thing I was going to say also to kind of tie this back in an episode we had, uh, I think at the beginning of last week, a little over a week ago, we talked with Susan K. Quinn about writing groups, right? Mm-hmm. And I would say, Nancy, you and I, you know, we have a little bit, we call it a social writing group in there, but when we actually, it, unfortunately, it's rare these days, but when we do talk writing, we mm-hmm. talk stuff like this. So if you're trying yep. to make things more interesting and um, less repetitive or anything like that, talk about it with some other writer friends. This is a great kind of conversation you can have over a drink or mm-hmm. over dinner, or whatever, with a group of people like we're doing right now, and you can really hash out some things. So it's something that you don't, that doesn't require a lot of commitment on anyone's part. Um, mm-hmm. There's not like, oh, print out 10 pages and read it. And yeah, it's just a conversation. Pages. Exactly. You can have a single conversation yeah. about a single story um, pretty pretty easily. Um, so definitely, you know, approach approach writing friends and, and, and do that. That's another, that's another um, great way to, that's another great way to, to work on this kind of stuff. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so, so where's our where's Lewis, or or Chris or whatever his name is? Lewis, who looks like Chris. He got just it. got a visit from the cops. That's right. Okay. For a cat napping, someone said <laughs> in the comments. <laughs> Which ties into his you know his job. His job is not being paid for, so you could say it's his internship. I mean that would be that would be a great kind of like a, you know yeah towards the end of the the story where you know the cops come and show up and he gets fired. Like, so Mittens has gone missing from the shelter. Yeah. And the cops come visit Lewis and uh, they they take him downtown. Okay. And they handcuff him to a bench. And so he's he's losing out on even more training time. God, this is going to be like a seven hundred page epic. 
I was going to say, we wouldn't want to, I would, at this point, I wouldn't want to come back to training time. We got to move on to, to make it not repetitive, right? Um, you know, maybe he's missing some other qualifier. Maybe he's missing some other deadline. He's got to be somewhere. To, he's got to, or maybe he, the, you know, he's got the one shot from the family, right? The wife's like, oh, okay, you know, here's your, you know, let's talk things out and I'm going to be waiting for you. We're going to meet at this diner or whatever, like halfway between my parents' place. And then the cops show up and, and we got to question you, right? And, mm -hmm. and so now and things just all around get even worse. And so, I feel like you can have both of those things happen, right? We, no, wait. Yeah. I'm trying to keep. I'm kind of trying to keep track of the ups and downs. We yeah. Had. Okay. And so, yeah, you don't want to have just negative, negative, negative. So it would be like some kind of success would happen, mm -hmm. and and this is part of us just going off the cuff and not actually writing this stuff down, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, that, that's just a weakness in the way we're doing it. But that would be a good example of like I wouldn't mm -hmm. to keep it from being repetitive. I wouldn't want to like. The bad part isn't always going to be I'm losing out on training time. That's going to be maybe earlier in the book. Sure. Maybe mm -hmm. it could be like a choice now. Like he manages to like get out from the, you know, he gets away from the cops, but he doesn't have enough time to do both. He doesn't have enough time to meet his wife at the diner and go like compete in the regional. So he has to choose. Well, and he can, he can, Lewis can have two goals. Mm-hmm. You know, you can essentially run two tri fail cycles at the same time, whereas where one goal is I need to be training, and that's not – maybe every time something bad happens, he's not like, oh, I'm missing out on training time. But that's like what's going on in the background is that the, the reader knows there's a ticking clock. Yes. And so that's mm – -hmm. tension is always being increased because he's got a week left until the opening round. He's got five days left. He's got three days left, and so that's something that's always going on in the background while he's struggling towards these other things. And that's also, just as this isn't really on topic, and sort of, but if, if you're writing anything that's kind of like thriller-based or you want it to be high tension and like moving fast, put that ticking time bomb element in the story. You know, put that... The countdown, day countdown, yeah. hour yeah. countdown, like whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Put a countdown in there, and, and it will automatically build tension. Um, okay, perfect. So, did so, we decide what happened to him? What so he got to him? he got taken downtown to be questioned. Okay. Um, and then you know I don't I'm not sure where we're at in the book if we're we're right now it's 7:45 so I'd say we're we're, we're approaching Act Three. That's where we are in the book. Yeah, we um, are. <laughs> he's he's and, trained enough. Yeah, he's like. trained enough. <laughs> okay. And so maybe he gets taken downtown right at the time that he's actually got to be at the at the at one of the early competition like signups like a weigh in type thing. Yeah. Right. Ooh, and he, and yeah. he gets taken downtown uh, when he needs to be at this place. So okay. his next goal would have to be he's got to talk his way into letting them release him. And the conflict is that um, Officer Stevens, who's a uh, who's a very very hard nosed cop, he would be played by um, Brian. What's his face? Who's a cop in all those movies? Old guy. He's in Rock. He was in. First Blood, Rambo. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that guy. That guy. You could go with a younger guy, like the the, the guy who who liked Lewis's wife before Lewis married him, married her. Oh, right? that would be. So got, I was thinking about when that person would drugs. show up. Yeah. 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 He can't or the chief of police could be his brother. Dun dun dun. <laughs> oh, oh that, no, that's 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 good. the plot twist because when we saw his brother the first time, he wasn't wearing a cop uniform, but now yeah. his brother strolls into the jail. Wearing his sheriff's uniform, we find out that Matt Damon is actually the town sheriff, and so Lewis has to talk his way out. He's got to plead with him. That's the conflict is his brother mm -hmm. doesn't want to let him out of jail, right? So there's this has to be a yes but kind of disaster because he's got to be able to get out. You know, we can't hold him in jail until after the tournament because then there's no ending to the book, right? So he's got to be able to get out of jail. He's got to convince his brother to let him leave, but it's going to come at a cost. Right, right. Mm. Um, and to, this is going to be a little bit off topic of the tri fail. I, I, I thought of it, so I'm not going to want to mention it in there. So to, if, we, if I were to go back and like knowing that, knowing that the brother is the law, right, I would want to make Lewis way more, you know, Nancy, you said he's too lawful good, right? If his brother's yes. the law <laughs> and there's tension there, I would definitely want to make the brother Lewis. Well, he necessarily would be the opposite if his oh, brother yeah. was the law. Like, just, yeah. yeah. And so I would want to make him like the, you know, he was he was always acting up when he was a kid, but he finally started to get his life together. He got a wife, but she knows his kind of background for rowdiness or, or chaos, and that's why she's not willing to 
give him very much leniency with the job situation or life in general. Well, so maybe he's, he's had a lot of jobs in the past and he's gotten yeah. fired for like rowdiness or whatever. So yeah, exactly. you're right. She could be. So on when the when he loses the job now, right, his lumberjack job, then she just immediately assumes it's one thing, right? Right. And, so, and that's why she's like, okay, I'm taking off. Well, he goes to the brother, like, I need help with this. And he's like, I told you, you should, you know, last time was the last time. You had to get your act together, right? Mm-hmm. There's the break in at the pawn shop. <laughs> this is the ultimate timeline of what we're talking about. Well, no, I would say, I would say, you know, there could have been a break in at the pawn shop, and that's why he got picked up in the first place. And what it comes down to, so now there's a question of, like, well, did he actually do it or not? Because we don't show it. Maybe we show that scene where he's thinking about it. And then, so. So when this trilogy is hugely successful, and then we go back and we write the another book from his brother's perspective, you know, it'd be called yes. um, Plaid instead of Gray. It would be from his brother's perspective. That's when we include the um, breaking into the pawn shop scene because Lewis doesn't. Lewis blacks out those kind of memories, but his brother remembers right. everything. Well, he could be trouble. an unreliable narrator. He would. He wouldn't like necessarily be thinking about those. Maybe so. That's that's good. This yeah. is good. Wait. So where are we? Let's let's fast forward back yeah, to the so, point. Sorry, so no, we, I didn't mean to distract us. But if so, if we were what, where I was going with that, if you wanted to tell like a kind of a tighter story, that's the kind of thing you would want to do. Where originally we yeah. had very like good, but then if you introduce a story element, that kind of is boring with that, right? Like you don't want. Right. There's no way two brothers are going to dislike each other that are so similar. Like there needs to be kind of tension between them. Well, the point is, we you the elements are loose enough that we can go back and be like, oh, oh, exactly. well, this would work out really well, like right here. Exactly. And, you know, you don't have to like rewrite a bunch of stuff. It's just yeah. Like, you know what? This is this is one pro of being a plotter over a pantser because if we were pantsing this and we got seventy five percent of the way through the story and then realized that the brother was actually the cop, think of how much we'd have to go back and rewrite. Oh, right? you have to change the main character of your book, like entirely. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Kate Morgan in the comments says that what happens is the wife bails him out. I like yeah, that. That's, that's the wife is at the jail. That's great. I like that. So you know, she his shows brother's up. not going to let him out. His brother's like, you've crossed me for the last time, Lewis. Mm-hmm. And the wife shows up and bails him out. Yes. It's brilliant. Thanks, and Kate. You, and then you tie up, so we're moving into Act 3, right? We're moving along, yeah. and now all of a sudden that kind of subplot, she has, there's reasons. She bails him out, and things reasons. are good. Maybe it's because he is trying so hard. Even yeah, if you would, I mean, hopefully. <laughs> you would want to, he, he has done something before this that we detailed in the book. When we haven't talked about right, but something happens where he he does a good thing for the wife, and then he gets picked up, and then she finds out about it and she comes and helps him out. Right? But he can't. The wife can't be too happy with him or the story right. ends because his goal is to get her yeah. back. So right. she's got to be bailing him out conditionally. You know, it's got to mm-hmm. be like, yes. I'm going to yes, help but... you this time, but I'm not ready to come back yet. He, he's done something enough to like. She wants to keep him out of jail. She's giving right. him another chance to actually like try to finish to what he, said he was going to do. Right. 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 Okay, so he's out of jail. So I What's guess his he's next got a goal. I guess I mean, now we, he's yeah. We move into Act Three, and so we're moving into the final kind of like we're gonna we're gonna go do the competition. Um, uh-huh. Well, like you said, Jimmy, he's got its way into like being able to qualify or whatever that looks like. Or do we need to like fast forward? Something? Um. I don't. I don't know how much story we, do you guys we, think. Is we, we, have, we, have, we have five minutes. We have five minutes left. We, we can do this in five minutes. Let's do it. So, so we we fast forward, right? So I I want to kind of you know almost get to the point of wrapping. We don't need to go. I don't think plot by plot or point by point, but um, mm. the idea here is is I like to do kind of some twists and, and make sure you realize what your story is really about. Like, is this a story really about him winning a, a lumberjack competition? No, this is a story about him right. keeping his family together. Right. right. And so, um, I would want to whatever ends up in the in in the outcome. And I'm sorry to be rushing this; and more just a kind of a time constraint. But whatever happens in the end of it, also to kind of say this: if you guys have any more questions, thank you. Everyone's been like really responsive in the chat mm-hmm. so far. <laughs> ask them now, and then we'll talk, and then we'll get to them. So ask them now in the chat, and then we'll we'll get to it. Um, but keep in mind what your story is actually about. Bring it back to that. I would. Um, off the cuff, I would have him lose the competition, right? I was about to say, let's talk about what the ending looks like. Yeah, and and so and but have use that as a character growth moment where it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a no it's I guess not a no and or it's you know it's the he's going to lose the competition but something else is going to happen. Well, what would you do, Jim? What would your ending well, to this be? 
Uh, I like the idea of him losing the competition, but if we're going to have him lose the competition and he would have to learn something, maybe one thing like we could do would be to go back through the story and place more importance on the axe. Mm-hmm. And then and then he what he learns is that he he makes it to the quarterfinals with the crappy axe. And the, and he learns something about self-worth. That's okay. pretty cliche, like but it's it's one way to end the story. It's not I mean it's not right. too cliche if that's what we build it in. I mean because everyone is down on him. That's the whole point of the, the story. Like the brother's not giving right. any chances and the wife cuts him short. And that all comes back to like because of your actions in the past, you've done this and where he don't trust you. And that has played in on, you know, how he views himself. And, you know, maybe it's something his daughter says to him, or maybe it's something that, you know, the wife says to him, or, you know, mm-hmm. somebody important to him kind of says and has that revelation moment of like, you know, this isn't actually what's important in your life. It's something else. You're you're focusing on this, or, or whatever the case is. And you would yes, make sure you go back and see that appropriately. Um, but so in in terms of try fail cycles, the important thing is, his goal was to get his family back. So the very last try fail cycle in the book is try succeed. Right, and that's really the he can have small successes along the way, but the last thing that he tries is the thing that gets him his ultimate goal in the book. So the last thing that he tries maybe is maybe it's walking away from the competition. You know, maybe right. it's deciding not to go compete in the finals because of reasons and and instead and that's in doing that is what convinces his wife and daughter not to leave him. Right. Right. I was just picturing her like at a soccer game or something. And he chooses not to yeah. Oh, that's that's got Hallmark Lifetime movie all over it. Yeah, and so <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like um, it though. Because we are we are running a short on time. If we were going longer, we could probably hash it out some more. But um, yeah, just keep in mind what your story is about, and then when you get, if you do something like we're doing right now, if you do it by yourself, you do it with other people, whatever the case is, obviously you want to be writing all these plot points down. But then go back and do a second pass, right, and make it even stronger. Now that you know the end, we talked about this a few times. Now that you know the end of what this story is really about. Now go back and make the beginning really interesting, right? Right, right. Like he go, he loses the axe in the beginning. Not maybe, maybe not because he pawns it off, but maybe because he had a night out drinking and he misplaced it and someone stole it. And yeah. then it, it ended up in a pawn shop and he couldn't buy it back because he didn't have the money because he lost his job because he was out drinking and he lost his axe. Then you have a whole <laughs> redemption alcoholism subplot. We, yeah, right? and so that would be something to keep in mind is that we get to the end and we kind of know more about what the story's about. Now go make the beginning also really interesting and, and kind of right. do a second pass and retie everything in. I think Kate Morgan has a really good question in the comments here that just came in a couple of minutes ago. Okay, Kate Morgan. So um, so mm-hmm. would you guys say the cycle is try-fail until Act 3, second plot point, uh, where the cycle then turns to failure-redemption? Um... If, if I had to be really general about it, yes. And so... Uh, what do you think, hard, Jim? I mean, it's even hard being that general. I, Sorry, would say, I would say essentially try-fail goes from beginning to end of your story. Yes. And, and failure redemption is like a part of that. I mean, because if, if you look at a story as a whole, anything that's not try-fail is essentially exposition. Yeah, and so you want to be True. making your characters active, right? So we've done an episode about proactivity. Um, right. And I think try fail cycles even came up in that when we talked with the lead about it. Um, and so, yeah, your try fails are going to keep going and going and going until they stop, and when they stop, your story's done. Right. And so, um, I mean, it's the very, very end. You're, I would say the stakes keep going up. Maybe as you move into Act 3, mm-hmm. uh, the stakes stop going up so much and start to get the storylines start to get tied off. So you're going to start to have more maybe try successes. Mm -hmm. The smaller ones, right? As things get wrapped. And then, you know, ultimately culminating in the the, the biggest plot point or whatever that is. In our case, it's, I think it's going to be, you know, the realization that that he's not doing this for the the lumberjack competition or whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. Right. That we that we finally decide upon, um, and so I mean they really continue until the story's done, 
And so you're just going to start wrapping up some of the, the plot points as you move into Act 3. But generally speaking, that's not to say that the tri-fail cycles stop. Yeah, it seems like the failure, like it only becomes redemption towards the end when there's the stakes are high enough and the character's grown enough that it's like a redemptive moment. Because just having one of those early on in the story doesn't seem like it would be very impactful. Like there's no, there's no reason for it to be interesting. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. You got to get the I characters think... bought into it. Or sorry, the readers bought into the character. I think that for for newer writers, it's it's kind of hard to think in terms of tri fail cycles. Like I know when I first started learning about it and trying to apply it to my writing, it, it didn't feel very natural. And one of the things that I did was when I was reading fiction, you know, just for enjoyment, I would start to try to look for tri fail cycles. Uh, I mean, I think in any kind of quest book or any kind of thriller or suspense book. I mean, you're probably not going to find tri-fail cycles in YA books about self-discovery so much. Um, mm-hmm. But in any... I, I think you will. <laughs> if, you, if you look for... D- what depends. I've noticed is as I started, yeah, as I started paying attention more and more and more attention to tri-fail cycles, that was, I found them more and more frequently. Yeah, and they come in a lot of different flavors and they can be a lot more subtle. Um, you know, like in your average John Green book where it's about a young boy and a quirky girl that he's he's attracted to, you don't find a whole lot of the, the kind of standard goal conflict disaster. It might be a lot more subtle than that. Mm-hmm. But that was one of the things that I did to, to teach myself how to use it more reliably was look for it a lot in fiction and notice those patterns and notice that, you know, the sequel part of a scene might be three sentences. It didn't have to be... 30 pages of a character trying to think of what I do next, and it, it might go by so quickly that you don't even notice it. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think it's one of those cases where they they are very, very prevalent in writing, in good writing, um, and because they make the story interesting, it's part of that tension building. It's part of keeping people engaged. Um, and so they're going to... Watch for them whenever you go back and start reading. You know, anytime you're reading, whatever you read next, almost guaranteed, whatever chapter you're reading, you're going to see them. You're mm-hmm. going to see them on a very small scale, and you're going to see them on a very on a much larger scale. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and a lot of the reading I do, the series I like, right, with uh, you know Jim Butcher's Dresden Files, or I'm going through the Wheel of Time right now. I'm getting towards the end of it. <laughs> um, it you can't have. It, I, I feel like the Wheel of Time. Every single sentence is a tri fail cycle. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not <laughs> not really exactly. like, like it's like like this is great, but then this like and it's just like that tension. Uh, okay. I view that as a try fail cycle in a se- in essence like a very small like yeah this is great and then no it's not and then <laughs> okay you know and that's where I say they can be very very small um, because you can have them just w- within short conversations like I'm gonna get this but then nope no I'm not or right. yes I am but no I'm not and then. Um, and those conversations can be very brief, or or whatever the case is. I'm gonna try and do this. Nope, you're not. And uh, and so just keep that in mind. Um, I'm kind of going through the uh, the comments, see if there's anything else we missed. I think we got most of it. J. Brian Dennehy, thank you so much, Brian J. Walton, for uh, yeah. that. That was the old the old grizzled white guy who always played a cop or a military guy. I was gonna say Brian. Oh, okay. okay. I knew that Brian was <laughs> Um, so when does the multi-author lumberjack novel box set come out? It's a wonderful question. Been thinking about it now that we've been talking. I don't want to get on that. Um, it could be so good. It could be good. You can make a really interesting story. I know. That's what I'm thinking. You can exactly. make, I mean, but, but the point like, of that I'm is I'm imagining like, the covers right now, and they look amazing. Yeah, I mean, well, you're. I think you're imagining Chris Just, Hemsworth, right? Totally shirtless yeah. with plaid. Yeah, plaid. Different shirt flannel around his waist, you know. axe over his shoulder, like a bitter-looking Matt Damon in the background. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and like and a kid with his arms somewhere. crossed. Yeah, and somewhere yeah. on the cover art, like that's the thing. Like somewhere on the cover art, there's a cat or a kitten, like blended into the landscape or whatever, manscape or whatever yeah. it is. Um, no, the cat's on a missing persons poster. It's just the the oh, the well it's, played. It's it's nailed to a tree with the cat's face on it. It's just missing. <laughs> well played. Um, I, I, think, I think the essence of that, if like we, because I told a lot of people, that, you know, in all the things I put out, I was like, we're going to be plotting a book, right? We're going to be mm-hmm. kind of doing plot points for one. And I didn't tell them it was going to be a lumberjack story. So like, people were like on the cover, like, 
you're going to outline a lumberjack story? Like, I don't want to, I'm not interested in that. But the, the point to draw it back, though, is that, especially in more character-driven stuff, you can make an interesting story about almost anything, right? Mm-hmm. About any, almost oh, anything yeah. you can think of. There are ways to make it interesting, and so... Um, I think almost anything is interesting if you write it well. Like, I would read this story, just what we have, kind of what we have. If someone told me the premise and gave me the book, I'd be like, okay, yeah. <laughs> sure, why not? Like, it's just a, a story about a person. He just happens to be a lumberjack. Yeah, and so, perfect. Um, I don't I don't see any other kind of pertinent questions, so a uh, couple things that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, okay. Nancy, you're leaving your job soon, so that's exciting. We're going to have some changes. I don't think there's going to be any changes affecting the podcast. Nah. Uh, not from a listener standpoint. There will be yeah. some stuff from our standpoint. We'll probably talk about those eventually. Um, I think that's about it from us, though. So, Jim, uh, we didn't really talk about you. I felt bad when we I, we launched into it, and I was like, you know, we, oh. he's been on the show before, but we didn't talk about him. So, Jim, you're an author. You've got yes. your own podcast. What you, yes. So you do a podcast. Yep. What is the, uh, tell us a little bit about your podcast for those who haven't listened to your other episodes. I do, uh, if you haven't listened to any of the five episodes I've been on so far, I do a podcast called Indie Author Answers where I read a section of my unpublished first novel each episode and then I critique it. I tear it to pieces on the podcast. Indie I'm Author sorry. Answers. That's the name yeah. of the show. Indie, indie Author Answers. I it's such it's a good. Cool, please go check it out. Yeah, it's such Thank a cool you. premise. Um, yeah. And so we have these episodes, which are going to be coming out over the next couple of days, um, with Jim. But we've also got one other on self-editing, which is very pertinent and timely, probably for a lot of people. I, mm-hmm. I seem to know a lot of people right now that are in the middle of that editing process, probably because everything we did with Alita, and with the offer yeah. she gave, she had a lot of people sign up for the offering, and so, you know, for her twenty percent off and all that. And then we gave out some coaching things to a bunch of people, and and. Uh, so it's been a month of people going like, I have to edit, I have to edit right now. And uh, and so we probably should have released the episode we did on self-editing. Um, perfect. So I think that's, uh, that's going to do it for us. So Jim, why don't you tell, so you told us about your podcast. Where can all the listeners go and find you, connect with you, find all your stuff that you've got going on? You can find me at jimheskett.com. That's J-I-M-H-E-S-K-E-T-T dot com. Perfect. And again, as always, we'll have links in the show notes for everything. So, Nancy, I don't know if you had any kind of closing comments or thoughts or anything you wanted to share. No, that this this was a fun conversation. It was. It was a lot of fun. We need to do more yeah. like this. Um, do. Yeah, I have a few other ideas for things like this that would be good for live shows. So I'm thinking like we talked about doing like cover critiques. We yeah. could do some um, book description critiques, and I've already got some people kind of lined up. Not lined up, but in mind for both of those. Cool. Um, this would be fun, yeah, just for live shows. So. Um, okay, and whenever we can have Jim back, that would be good. I know, right? Of course. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be talking a lot of craft, and so we've got to get more of those episodes kind of scheduled out. Yeah. Um, we are, real quick, we are doing an, uh, an after party. I say we, I, whoever can stick around. Um, and so we're going to be doing an after party. I'll put a link in the comments as soon as we're done, and so everyone, whoever clicks first can join. And uh, I think that's going to be it for us. So everyone, thanks for joining. Thanks for hanging out. If you If you're here, leaving comments, participating. Um, Mm -hmm. Have a great weekend. And uh, so for Jim Haskett and Nancy Elliott, I'm Matt Morris. This has been the Author Strong Podcast. Take care.